Amen. So keep your place there in Galatians chapter number 5. So we're starting a new sermon series this morning. I'm excited about this um, called Fruits of the Spirit. Fruits of the Spirit. And in Galatians chapter number 5, if you look down at verse number 1, the Bible says, um, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. So here we see this word that people love today. We see this word called liberty, and I'm going to show you that this word is a little bit misunderstood today. From a biblical basis, it means something a little bit deeper, a little bit different than what the average American would think liberty means. But basically what Paul is saying throughout the, the chapter in Galatians chapter number 5 is he is saying is that the law can't kill you anymore. The law has no power over you to send you um, to hell, to send you to that second death. Instead, you are free in Christ. So why would you Put yourself in bondage to sin is what he's talking about. Um, to just go freely sin. This is to all those people that would say, oh, if you believe in eternal security, you believe you can just do whatever you want. No, because why, Paul is saying, why would you put yourself in bondage when you're really free? So if you're saved, you're free this morning. You have true liberty from the law, meaning you're free from the law. The law cannot kill you. So it's kind of like you would be giving power to someone, something, that really has no power over you is what it comes down to. And if you think about that just um, in a secular you know, sense, you know, some you know, weak person that could never overpower you, why would you just let that person just overpower you and, and take control of you? And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying now that you are saved, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, as the Bible says in Ephesians chapter number 1. You're indwelled. God has given you that down payment, that earnest of the Holy Spirit inside you and he's saying he's trying to convince you through the word of god here to allow the spirit to lead you even though you are going to have the flesh with you until you know you perish physically um, on this earth so paul is saying be led by the spirit here's what that looks like don't be led by the flesh here's what that looks like so i want to look at the fruits of the spirit for the next few weeks here and just kind of pick out some of these fruits of the Spirit and see how we can, you know, apply those to our lives and make sure that we are truly looking at ourselves and following that Spirit that is in us, the Holy Spirit, and not the flesh. All right, look down at Galatians chapter number 5. Look down at verse number 18. So the kind of the core here is uh, starting in verse number 18 for this series where the Bible says, But if ye, let, if ye be led of the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, meaning they're known, they're shown in these things, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. You're going to keep your place on this page, wherever it is in your Bible, because I'm going to come back to this, um, these couple verses at the end of the sermon. But it's important these Lists of works of the flesh are very important when it comes to the works of the Spirit. All right, look down at verse number 21. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But, now we get the fruits of the Spirit here. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such there is no law. So Paul here is talking about how to recognize works of the flesh versus works of the Spirit. And we want to be led by the Spirit in our Christian lives. And that's why he gives this list. And it's interesting when he's giving the works of the flesh that he says, you know, this isn't even a complete um, list. All right. He says, you know, and such, you know, which are these, right? He says, and such like, which is like things like this. All right, is what he's saying. This isn't an all-encompassing list. But today and this morning, what I want to focus on as far as works of the Spirit, you see all these different things listed, but I want to look at um, the one that is listed out at the end of verse number 22, which is this word that says goodness. And that's what I want to look at um, this morning. Because this is, a very, uh, this is a very confusing concept today, this idea of goodness. Paul is saying um, that the Bible is saying that the, one of the fruits of the Spirit is goodness. All right? You say, why is that so confusing? All right? Well, if you go out soul winning, and if you're a soul winner, this is one of the reasons that you, know, you should be a soul winner, is that the Bible will just be, 
it'll just be, be shown to you. It'll just be manifest to you, the words of the Bible. And you'll notice that as you go out soul winning and you talk to many people out there, that the number one belief that people have, obviously, is some form of works righteousness. Some form of, I need to do what? I need to do good things to get myself to heaven. And the interesting thing about what most people believe, and if you've been a soul winner, you know, this is nothing new to you, is that most people think they're pretty good. As a matter of fact, some of the worst people in history thought they were doing good things. You know, Hitler, Stalin, these, these evil, some of the most evil men in history thought they were doing good, thought they were doing something that was right. So the question is, as we see a fruit of the Spirit is goodness, the question is, what is good? Look at Philippians chapter number four. You're going to keep your place always bookmark Galatians chapter number five and go over to Philippians chapter number four. So if we want to make sure that we're following in goodness, that we're, we're you know, we have goodness, we need to understand what is good. And this is something, unfortunately, that is changing every day, especially uh, for people outside the Word of God, you know, what is good is changing. What is good is not something that is, you know, being taught as something that is objective. It is something that is being changed, something that is being twisted. Look at Philippians chapter number four. Look at verse number eight. The Bible says this. It says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are, are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of what? Look at this. Good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So Paul is saying, think on good things. Yet most people think, I'm a good person. Most people, the interesting thing about works-based righteousness is anyone that believes it thinks that they will never tell you that they are without sin. Rarely will you find somebody that says that they are perfect and without sin. So the question you have to ask that person is, well, how good do you have to be to get to heaven? And that person will always say, well, about as good as me, is what their thoughts are. They set that bar to get to heaven just at the level that they are, whether they're, you know, because you know, look, is someone good, how good someone is compared to someone else is, you know, completely relative to those two people, if we're comparing two people, all right? But the Bible says that no one is good. Turn to Matthew chapter number 19. So this is the problem. If you have to be a good person to go to heaven, the Bible says that no one's going. Look at Matthew chapter number 19. Matthew chapter number 19. But most people think this. Most people think, be good, go to heaven the vast majority of people. So the question is, is anyone good? Look at Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Notice the word good coming up and how many times it comes up here. And he said unto him, Jesus call, answers back and says, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into, into life, keep the commandments. Now, a lot of people will misread these two verses, and a lot of people will misread these verses, and you'll actually have people like bring these verses to you every now and then and say, see, Jesus said he wasn't God. No, Jesus is actually saying, I am God here. You just have to look at it. You know, Jesus, I'm glad that like the Bible was written down because the majority of people that heard Jesus speak missed what he was saying. And he did this, I believe, on purpose. He was speaking at a, another level compared to most people that were listening to him. He says, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. So we know Jesus was literally without sin. He was good, meaning what? He's calling himself God here. Jesus is literally declaring to these people, to this rich young ruler, that he is God. But then he says, but if thou wilt enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. So what he says to this young man is, if you want to go to heaven, you better be good too. He's saying, it's going to take you keeping, like what commandments? All the commandments. He says, keep the commandments. Verse number 18, he saith unto him, which? 
And Jesus says, you know, so now Jesus is just kind of pointing out some things that he knows this young man is going to say. Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The man saith unto him, All these things which I have kept from my youth up, what I lack yet. So that's not true, first of all. Jesus saith unto him, said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. So now Jesus just calls him out because he knows this young man's heart. He knows what this person's main issue is. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So look, Jesus is saying, I am the only one that is good. So there is no person that is good. Look, Romans 3, uh, the verses that we start out with when we're soul winning, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, there is none righteous, no not one, points out this direct problem. There is no one that is good. There are no people that are good. But, so you say, why is goodness then a fruit of the Spirit? Because there's no one that is good, meaning you're without sin. But you can do good things. You can think on good things. And that's why goodness is a fruit of the Spirit. So the next question becomes, now that we know that no one is good, but you can have goodness. No one is good, no one is perfect, no one is righteous. All those things um, mean basically the same thing, but you can do good things. You can think on good things. So the next question becomes, how do we know what are good things? How do we know, and this is the major problem that we're facing today and that Christians have faced, that people, mankind have faced, has faced throughout history, is what is goodness? What are good things and what are bad things? Turn to Nahum. Chapter number one. Nahum chapter number one. Nahum chapter number one. So we know that the only individual who is good is God. That's kind of our first clue right there. We're looking for goodness here. We're looking for how do we know which things are good and which things are not good. Because the world will lead us astray horribly here. Look at Nahum chapter number one. And look at verse number seven. The Bible says the Lord is good. Here we see it again. A stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. So look, we, here we see two, two words here. That Number one, who's good? The Lord is good. And then we see this word trust. And the only individual who is good is God. So that's telling us right there that the only person, the only entity that we can trust goodness coming from is God. Is what? The words of God. Turn to 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter number 4. There's a lot of philosophies out there, and we'll go through a couple of them this morning that teach that, oh, you don't need the Bible, you don't need the Word of God to know morality, to know ethics. You know, ethics is this, you know, kind of secular word for morality. But turn to 1 John chapter number 4. And I'm going to show you this morning that you cannot know goodness unless you know the Word of God. There is no way to know. Look at 1 John chapter number 4. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. See, this is the problem right here. This is the problem that all of these secular philosophies will always run into. But try the spirits, whether they are of God because many false prophets are gone out into the world. By spirits here, it's meaning, you know, the philosophies, the people that are telling you things, the, um, the ideas that are being put forth. Turn to Isaiah chapter number 5. So the Bible is saying you have to try the spirits. You have to measure the spirits. You have to take what is being said to you. You have to take these ideas. You have to take these philosophies that people are spreading. And you have to try them against what? You have to try them against some measuring stick, against some filter, in order to see if what? If they are of God. Because there's a lot of spirits that are going to be claiming to be of God. There's going to be a lot of ideas that are going to be claiming to be of God. There's a lot of ideas that don't even claim anything 
about God, but you have to try all spirits, ideas, philosophies, whatever it is, against the Word of God. So how do you do that? How do you do that? See, what the Bible is teaching here is that the truth will be distorted. That goodness, what is good and what is not good, will be changed. Look at what we're dealing with today. Look at what we're dealing with with just the media in our country, um, just the media across the world. Just, I mean, you can almost look at the media stories that come through and that are being reported on, and you can almost with certainty say, I don't necessarily know what happened in that situation, but I know it didn't go like that. That's how bad the, you know, I, even, I hate even saying this word, but that's how bad the, the disinformation is today, and especially in the, the West or in our country in the United States of America. Look, it, and it's not just the mainstream media, it's the internet. It's, it's Google itself. It's all these different web engines and, and the results that they give you. There's been so many people that have done studies on how biased just search engine results are. Why? Because they're trying to define goodness to you. They're trying to redefine truth to you. They're like, no, 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 we'll give you our truth. But the Bible is saying you have to try everything against the Word of God. Everything against the Word of God. And on top of all that, on top of all that, I had an interesting um, scenario come up just um, studying for Wednesday's sermon. I was studying for Wednesday's sermon, and what was Wednesday's sermon about? Do you even remember? It was about boundaries. It was about boundaries, and it was about the boundaries that God put, the lines of the family, and how everything is laid out, and how God has specific roles for men and women, and uh, it's for the protection of children. There's very specific ways that God wants things done, the roles that women are to have, the roles that husbands and wives are to have. But another example of deception and of blurring the lines of goodness is artificial intelligence today. And I, I rightly predicted that it's going to just take away people's even ability, even ability to learn how to search for truth on the internet. Because if you search for some topic, you usually get, you know, I don't know, a hundred results to different web pages and all these different things. And then you have to kind of discern which of those, you know, sources of information are accurate, which are not which you know, is a skill in itself. Even searching for technical things is a skill in itself to be able to find the correct answer and the correct uh, you know, whatever it is um, solution to even a, a technical problem that is not a subjective thing. But the truth is being skewed today because now artificial intelligence, one of the main applications of it is it's just giving you the answer. It's just going and it's peeling information from whatever websites it chooses, and it's just handing you the answer right there. So you don't even have to click on a website. You just search some topic, and the artificial intelligence, whatever it is, whatever, whichever one it is, whatever engine it is, just gives you the answer. This is extra dangerous because you're putting a lot of trust in you know, what websites, what sources that that artificial intelligence used. But here's an interesting thing. I was thinking about the sermon on Wednesday, and a couple days before the sermon on Wednesday, I just, I just kind of had this term that kind of popped up in my head, the nuclear family. Have you ever heard that, the nuclear family? I think, it was a, I think it was a term that came up. It was invented in like the 1950s or something like that. But it's a general term that people know for a mother, a father, and children. Like a, a mom and a dad who are married, and then they have children. You know, the traditional family. And I figured, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Google this and see what the artificial intelligence tells me. All right? And I did, and I'm going to read you the answer right here. And I'm just going to show you that the deception of what is good and what is not good is just layer after layer after layer is being put in place in our society to hide what is good from you, to change what is good to you. This is literally what the answer is from Google's AI right here. It says, a nuclear family, I just Googled, like, a nuclear family definition. That's all I, I Googled. A nuclear family is a family unit that consists of parents and their children. You see a problem already? Mm -hmm. Typically living in one home. Typically living in one home. The term nuclear family was coined by social anthropologist Bronislaw Malinowski in the 1920s. Okay, I was wrong on that, um, if that's even true. The word nuclear is figurative and comes from the scientific applications of the word nucleus. 
Other names for a nuclear family include elementary family, atomic family, serial packet family, and conjugal family. Some characteristics of a nuclear family include, and this, there's three bullet points, adults, adults are typically married, but not always. The children can be biological or adopted. And the third bullet point is, the definition has expanded to include same-sex marriages. So the world's truth is simply changing, is what this tells us. And these sources cannot be trusted. The problem is, the Bible doesn't change. The Bible literally says, God literally says in his word, Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. And that's why every spirit, this is a spirit right here. This artificial intelligence engine is a spirit, and it must be tried of God. It must be filtered through the Word of God. And the problem is, if you don't know the Word of God, you cannot use this filter. Now, I think that there's going to be some actual uses, uses that might be societal benefits to artificial intelligence, whether it be the self-driving car or machine learning or factory applications or whatever. But other than that, I am highly skeptical of anything it writes. And I've already showed you that as far as doctrines and things like that. But look, or any decision it makes, by the way. God forbid we ever let these types of tools start making decisions in society. It's just another tool. Maybe it's the tool. Are you in Isaiah chapter number 5? Are you in Isaiah chapter number 5? Look down at verse number 20. It's just another tool. It's just another layer. And look, look maybe it ends up being the main tool to do this. Look at verse number 20 where the Bible says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's exactly what is happening today. The, what is good and what is not good is being eroded. It is being changed. And the Bible is very clear that there is good. There is good. And God is the only guaranteed source of it. All other sources of information in your life need to be tried against the Word of God. All other sources. Look, you need to be skeptical today. That's why I don't have any problem with conspiracy theory people. Look, you need to be skeptical today. You need to be trying these spirits. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 30. Proverbs chapter number 30. That means you need to know it, though. That means you need to know the Bible. Look, if you have not read the Bible cover to cover in your life, you need to make that a number one goal for yourself. You need to make that a number one goal for the next two or three months to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And look, read it in order the first time. Read it in order. Don't you know, go and do one of these chronological things. Read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in the order that it's put down for you. And then if you want to bounce around and do it different ways in, in coming years, that's fine. But you need to read the Bible cover to cover and understand what this book has. If you have not done that and you are saved, you are leaving a huge opportunity on the table for your, li for your life and for the life of your family. Look at verse number uh, 5 of Proverbs chapter number 30. Every word of God is pure. And look at this. Look at the second part of the verse. This is why it is important you know the Word of God. It says, He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. So the Bible is there to protect you against the changing truth, against the changing goodness of the world. And look, it's shocking how little people know today. It's shocking how much of the Bible, you know, people just don't know. But even the basic, I'm not even talking about Bible verses and memorization. I'm talking about just basic concepts in the Bible. You're noticing, if you're out souling for the last uh, several years, you're noticing just the basic concept knowledge in the population in our communities is dropping. The just the idea of even biblical concepts. I mean, how many kids in Gen Z are you running into today that have never even heard of Jesus? How many kids are you running into where you're like, well, you know who Jesus was, right? And they're like, no idea. They don't know who Jesus is. That is, I mean... It is shockingly common today. But what are you seeing with Gen Z? What are you also seeing with Gen Z? So you're seeing this generation arise that we've never seen such lack of information on just basic things on who Jesus Christ was. Not that they believe in him or don't believe in him. 
Just they've never even heard the story of him. They're like, I don't know. What, what, what was that all about? Maybe they heard the name, but they don't know that he was born of a virgin. They don't know that he was the son of God. They don't know why he, you know, what they claim that he even came here to do was. It's, it's shocking, but what else are you seeing in that same generation? You're seeing the most massively confused generation in the history of our country. Confused about just basic things about even their, you know, it, whether they're male or female. Just mass confusion, also coupled with what? Lack of knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lack of knowledge of the Word of God. Doesn't it make perfect sense? Since God and the words that He gave us is goodness, is the definition of goodness, is what we are supposed to try all different pieces of information through. And if you don't know that, it equals that you're confused. I mean, it makes perfect sense. I mean, even talking about because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Look, even false religions. You will have no defense. Someone would have no defense against some false teaching, some false religion. I mean, how will they know? How would someone know that doesn't know the Word of God that a Jehovah's Witness that comes to their door is, is not a, just another good person with a Bible? How would they know? There is no way to know unless you have the Word of God. That's why we need to try these spirits against the Word of God. And I mean, I don't know how many people, I, I've gotten several people saved that have been talking to the Jehovah's Witnesses. And every single one of those people, they thought the Jehovah's Witnesses were good people. They thought they were just teaching good things from the Bible. They didn't know that they were teaching contradictory things from the Bible. Why? Because they don't know what the Bible says. So we need to try these spirits. Because look, people will deceive you. People will lead you to destruction. It is super important. Even, look, turn to Proverbs 13. Even... Even on the level of just like material scammers, people will just lead you to destruction. People will just take all your, everything you've ever worked for without even thinking twice about it. Look at Proverbs 13. Look at verse number 11. It says, Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. This is talking about somebody who just wants to, you know, get their wealth, get their gain through not doing anything. This person in Proverbs 13, it says that person that doesn't want to go out and work for a living and, and get their wealth. Look, somebody that goes out and, and, and works hard is going gonna, is gonna to get wealth. And somebody that goes out and just goes into some get rich quick scheme, they could also get wealth too. But the Bible is saying that that person that goes into some get rich quick scheme, is gonna, th their wealth is going to go away very quickly. Why is that? And look, you'll see this so many times. I mean, the, the, be, the biggest example of this is like a lottery winner or something. Somebody that wins the lottery and then in five years they're dead. They're broke and they're in, their, you know, they're in horrible situations. But the point is, by making haste and wanting to not do things the Bible way, they are easy targets for people that just want to take everything from them. So you must know the Bible. You must know the Bible. It protects you in every, it's a shield in every area of your life. For your family, for your children, even for your job. It's a shield for you. So look, what's the application of all this? You say, is this really a sermon on doing good? No, this is not a, really a sermon on doing good. This is a sermon on knowing good. This is a sermon on recognizing goodness. Because, and here's where all the philosophies fall apart today. Here's where all these ideas like, well, we could have an atheist society, and as long as people just had ethics. You know, this is where the secular humanism falls apart. And I'm really going to explain to you, this is really where libertarian, libertarianism falls apart too. It's in recognizing goodness, but where all these philosophies fall apart is this. Without the Word of God... There would be no acknowledgement of the spiritual world. This is where all these secular philosophies fall apart. If you do not acknowledge the spiritual world, you know what you miss? You miss evil. And you miss the presence of evil. And that's where all 
philosophers and all secular philosophies that do not recognize the Word of God completely break down. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like you're trying to catch a bunch of minnows with a net with holes in it like that. It's not going to work. That's all these other philosophies because evil get, will get through that net. But no evil will get through this net. The Bible is saying, I can filter out every evil. So if you don't acknowledge the spiritual world, that's the miss. You miss the evil. And in order to recognize goodness, you must acknowledge the evil because it is there. Look, here's an example of this falling apart. The libertarian, uh, I don't know if you ever heard the libertarian uh, saying, well, the right of me to swing my fist, it ends where your nose begins. Turn back to Galatians chapter number 5. And let's test this out with the Word of God. And what the libertarian is saying here is that I should have the freedom. My libertarian philosophy says that I should have the freedom to do whatever I want to do as long as it doesn't harm you or as long as it doesn't harm someone else. Look, it sounds good on its face. It sounds good, but here is the problem. Look at the list in verse number 18 and verse number 19 and verse number 20 of Galatians chapter 5. Look at these works of the flesh. See, they miss the evil is the problem. Because look, I mean, I can just, I've underlined a few of them. Look at this. Where you, this is where I just underlined a few where this libertarian philosophy falls apart. Uncleanness. Well, the Bible says, like, well, if I'm unclean, if I'm living an unclean life, well, the Bible says that that's wrong. The libertarian would say, whatever. Idolatry. I'm worshiping some false god. Or I have some, you know, some even just like material idolatry, where I have something in my life, whether it be, you know, a family member or a, a person or a thing or a career or whatever it is, above God. Well, the libertarian would be like, what's wrong with that? Because God is not part of his philosophy. But the Bible is calling out. See, the Bible's, the holes in the Bible's net are, are microns. Nothing's getting through it. This is where libertarian philosophy, witchcraft. What does it matter? If I'm a witch, what does it matter to the libertarian to be like, whatever, as long as you're not pushing that on somebody else or forcing someone else or hurting someone else. No, but the Bible is saying witchcraft is evil. The Bible says, I suffer not a witch to live, suffer not a witch to live. I mean, the Bible calls out what evil. And here's the truth of it, folks. Here is the real problem that is missed by even libertarian philosophies, is that there is no sin. And this is what the Bible is pointing out. And you will miss this if you don't acknowledge the spiritual. There is no sin that does not affect others. It doesn't exist. So the libertarian will miss sins completely, and then they will take certain sins and say, oh, they don't affect others. Which is just like... It's intellectually weak, first of all. I mean, what did the libertarians years ago, what, what were they all about? They were all about, like, let's legalize all the drugs. Because they're like, whatever, if I want to sit in my basement and smoke marijuana or whatever, you know, that doesn't affect, that doesn't hit anyone else's nose. That doesn't affect anyone else. Are you going to stand up there with a straight face and tell me that someone using drugs only affects that person? I mean, what kind of mental capacity do you have if you literally believe that? Look at the drug addict epidemic in California and tell me that it only affects that individual person, you know, laying on the sidewalk. No, it affects it, it has already affected that person's family. It has already affected that person's children. It has already affected that person's marriage. It has already affected that, I mean, all these people, there's a reason that those people are out there and there's no one that will talk to them or help them. It's because they burned every bridge in their life. And those bridges are people. So don't tell me that this just everlasting drunkenness hurts no one. But the Bible could say, no, 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 that's evil. This drinking and drugs, it's like, look, it leads to divorce. And what does it lead to? Violence. Society as a whole ends up paying for it, literally. This idea that it just, oh, you know, as long as I don't hit somebody else's nose. No, you're hitting thousands of noses. 
aside from just that person. There is no sin that does not affect others. So just taking a, a libertarian example, number one, you would not be able to, you would miss a bunch of sins. You would not be able to correctly identify what things are sins and what things are not sins. And then number two, it adopts this philosophy that like, hey, you know, as long as my sin, and they wouldn't even call it sin, but as long as my actions don't affect other people, look, if it's sin, it affects other people. What does he literally say in Galatians chapter number five? He says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. If nothing else, if nothing else, people see that sin. They see you even as a Christian in that sin, doing that sin, and you're a terrible witness to other people. And you, you affect the lump. You affect other people. So look, the Bible gives us these deep definitions. And guess what? Turn to Matthew chapter number 5. The Bible even takes it further for us. The Bible gives us what is goodness, and it gives us, it acknowledges what is evil, so we will not miss anything. And it always says that, look, sin affects everyone. It gives us the proper view of sin. But the Bible, it goes so far beyond any other philosophy in, in one specific area. And no other philosophy will catch this. But look at Matthew chapter number 5. It even identifies evil in thought. It even catches evil and identifies it as sin as it's in thought, as it enters into your heart. And look, this is the challenge for the mature Christian right here. Because I stand up here and I preach all the time and I'm like, nah, fornication and drunkenness and, and, and drug use. And you all are sitting there and you're like, got it, got it, got it, cleaned up my life. But you know what will affect a mature Christian? And you know what will bring down even a mature Christian who's been in the Christian life, who's been sold out for years? Evil entering into your heart. That is where Satan will come after you. Look at verse number 28 of Matthew chapter number 5. Verse number 28 of Matthew chapter number 5. Jesus identified this. Jesus took this in a couple um, different places. Jesus says this in verse number 28. says, But I say unto you, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So where, somebody that goes out and actually commits physical adultery, look, that didn't just happen like in a second. It started in his heart. It started in her heart. It started as thoughts we were thinking as evil that entered in. In 1 John 3 uh, verse 15, the Bible says, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. So there, what is that talking about? That's just talking about something that you're thinking. Something that's in your heart, not something that you're doing. But look, turn to Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24, look at verse number 9. This, look, philosophies miss this. Libertarianism especially misses this. But Proverbs 24, look at verse number 9. Kind of this all-encompassing statement here. The Bible says, the thought of foolishness is sin. And the scorer is an abomination to men. The thought of foolishness is sin. This is one of the things that kind of really confused me when I was a Lutheran. Because we would sit there and we would have etch-a-sketch theology as long as I confess my sins every Sunday morning. I'm clear, and then I just got to confess my sins the next Sunday morning. But I'm sitting here and I'm seeing things where the Bible says, like, the thought of foolishness is sin. And I'm like, how long am I good for? Like, after I confess my sins, like, uh, like three minutes go by and I already thought about something stupid again. The thought of foolishness is sin. And the scorner is an abomination to men. Look, the Bible goes as far as to identify evil that comes into our heart. Go to Psalm chapter 14. Psalm chapter 14, look at verse number 1. Psalm chapter 14, look at verse number 1. Psalm chapter 14, and look at verse number 1. We've read this verse before, but I want to just point out something here that the first place that this kind of thought started was where? Look at verse number one. It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Where did that stupid statement come from? Where did that stupid, that philosopher, that atheist, where did that start from? It started from his thoughts, his heart. 
And the heart is deceitful above all things. And that's why Satan will come after a Christian there first. You've cleaned up your life. You've got things out of your life. You've got standards. You've got what? You've got boundaries in place. You've got those things setting up. But you know what? This is why you need the goodness of the Bible because the Bible is saying you need to even protect your heart. You're sold out. You're three to thrive. You're out soul winning. And look, if you take nothing else from this sermon this morning, take this. Satan will come after you especially through your heart. You say in what ways? Through ways like bitterness. Satan will look at ways to make you bitter. Look, that's something that as a Christian, as a, as a truly mature Christian, you should understand when you start becoming bitter towards someone, your church, your pastor, your brothers and sisters, whatever. If you have bitterness that is creeping in to your heart, that is something that you need to address right away because that is an attack. Envy. These are things that start in the heart. These are start, I mean, they, they all, I mean, envy will drive apart friends, drive apart brothers, drive apart churches, pride. All these things start in the heart. Because, and Satan starts here because from the thoughts come actions. And he has to start there. From the heart comes our words. You don't just say things. You don't just come out and say things that hurt other people. You've been thinking those things. You've had those things in your heart for a long time. And that's when you let those things out. And that's when you say those things. And then our words lead us to greater actions in our life. Look, no one is good. No one is good. But we should strive for goodness in thought, word, and deed in our lives. And the only reliable and complete source of that is the Word of God that is sitting on your lap this morning. And that's why there's such a campaign against it today. So if you know the Bible, you're going to be protected. You're going to have a shield against those things. But to the Christians, and especially to this church that knows the Bible, the biggest thing that I need you to look for is the attacks coming on your heart. And you, only you can see those coming. Only you know about those things. And they're things that grow. And they're things that are fairly easy to take care of. Look, if you're a Christian, you struggle with this. I'm a pastor. I struggle with this. But the key is to recognize it when it starts. So you can take care of it right away at the beginning. If you have to talk to somebody, if you have to get something, the air cleared on something, you do that. If you need to just let something go, you do that. But you keep your heart clear. And as a soul winner, I beg you to do this. Because as a soul winner, you will be attacked. Because Satan doesn't want you soul winning. Satan doesn't want you out there, you know, preaching the word of God. So I need you to protect your heart. You've cleaned up your life, but Satan's coming for you here. Because that's going to drive your life going forward. Look, every single person that has dropped out of the Christian life, that's where it started. It started in their heart. 100% of them. So that's what we all need to be careful and watch for. Goodness. The Bible has it. Guard your heart. Keep it in your life. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.